anxiety, spoil, let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to worship together this morning in spirit and truth. It makes me so joy, makes me feel so much joy to know that God could bring us anywhere, but he brought us right here this morning to worship together in spirit and truth as one church body, as one voice. Who's ready to do that this morning? Who feels a little joy of the gospel this morning?
His kingdom come. Amen, sir. We're going to sing another song.
church, sing it out loud. Amen. East Point, thank you, worship team. They always do a great job, don't they? Awesome. Amen. Yes, you can clap if you want. That's all right. Amen. Well, we uh, welcome you here this morning, whether you're here or you're online. Uh, If you're online with us this morning, uh, we welcome you and ask you to just hit that like button and subscribe. Uh, Also, if you're online with us this morning, could you just take a picture of you viewing the service for us. We'd love to see those. And you can send those to office support at epcjacks.com. We would love to see those and uh, make you famous in the service. So anyway, uh, be, a, be a good way to include you uh, as a part of us here. Um, wow, that song reminded me uh, that God can do it again. Right, And many times in the Psalms, we see the psalmist looking back at what God has done to have confidence about what he's going to do in the future. And, you know, really that's about a mindset, you know, what, what's going on in our head. And uh, the pastor's got a great uh, series that he begins this morning, Mind Work, so we're looking forward to that, Pastor. Uh, just a couple of things on a few activities that are, that are happening here in the near future. Uh, Trunk or Treat will be on Halloween night, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., uh, so that'll be a great time. Uh, also, we'll have a Ladies Savannah tour uh, on October the 9th uh, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, you can sign up and pay online uh, if you'd like to do that and are interested in being a part of that. Sounds like a great time, ladies, uh, and uh, young women as well. Uh, Ladies of all ages are invited, so uh, that'll be a great time. Let's continue our worship this morning, all right? Let's stand together uh, one more time as we continue worshiping together.
feels uplifted right now. Now we're going to sing my favorite song.
all that for you and me, church. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You may be seen. Well, good morning. Sure is good to see all of you guys. Missed you last week. Let me find out, where are Georgia fans today? I figured as much. How about FSU? They won, can you believe it? Amazing. How about our Florida fans? Where, yeah. I'm surprised you're here today. I'm glad though, I'm glad. It was a little depressing last night, wasn't it? Kentucky? I mean, come on. We have Kentucky fans? What is that? Oh my goodness. And uh, I, got, I can't leave out Hawaii, Pastor T. There you go. <laughs> All right. If I, didn't mention your, if I didn't mention your team, I'm sorry, but it's because they don't matter. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We have a divided congregation, don't we? A divided family. But uh, we all get along well in in worship, though. That's good. I want to invite your attention to the book of Romans. I'm going to read one verse to you out of the gospel of Matthew. So Matthew 22, and then Romans chapter 7. And uh, as it was mentioned, we're starting a new series today called Mind Works. And um, I'm looking forward to it. I I think it's going to be, I hope it's going to be a great series with you. I want to thank uh, Pastor T for his uh, wonderful message last week called Daily Delivery, and then also uh, the Gants for their presentation last week. Our hearts and minds are certainly there with them uh, with the work in Guyana as they plan to go back, and we have a part. I want to, hey, I want to build a church down there in uh, uh, Tobago, don't you? 15,000 bucks gets them this, man. Uh, Well, close to it. But uh, uh, $15,000 can build a church down there, and we want to help them all we can, and maybe even have part in, in putting that thing up. Wouldn't that be awesome? Take a group down there and, and be active in that. So, so when we talk about mind works, we're talking about a series about the way the mind works. And uh, in this series, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Somebody said, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We, uh, we all struggle with this. We're uh, none of us above the other. I'm not, I'm not presenting the, this lesson nor the series to you as though I have accomplished anything. I still struggle. Uh, in my own mind with various things, as does the Apostle Paul in the text we're going to look at. So before we dive into that text, though, I do want to read to you a verse that is sort of the anchor verse for the whole series, okay? And that comes out of Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. The uh, context of that verse is that some people have come to Jesus, the a religious group, the, uh, they want to test him, they want to trick him, they want to tempt him. And so they said, which of the commandments is the greatest commandment? And thinking they could somehow uh, get him to say one is above another, but he goes right into, without hesitation, he makes this statement. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So I want you to think with me on what that means for just a little bit. What does it mean to love God with all your mind? The word heart in that text is the Greek word cardia, and it means, of course, the seat of our feelings. The word soul in that text uh, is the term suke, and it talks about the very breath of our life and probably indicates the innermost part of us. And then we find the word mind, which is the word deonia, and it literally means the faculty of our understanding. You should love God with your understanding, with your intellect. And as we approach this today, I'd like to give you somewhat of a definition of this, loving God with all your mind. It means to dwell on God 
in your thoughts, to have God at the focal point in your life. I could use an illustration with you, and I will for just a moment. Uh, If we contrasted two pretty dominant characters in the Old Testament, King Saul and King David. King Saul was very egocentric. Now, by that phrase, we mean he was self-centered. While David, on the other hand, was very theocentric or God-centered. You might remember that when God replaced Saul with David, he said, I want to put in here as king a man after my own heart. Well, I want to suggest to you that being after the heart of God is the same thing as being after the mind of God. It's when your feelings line up with his feelings, when your thoughts line up with his thoughts. We struggle with this in the life that we live, and and we're going to address this issue from the viewpoint of the mind being a battleground. I want you to consider that with me for a moment. The mind is a battleground on which spiritual warfare takes place, in which spiritual warfare takes place. I want to give you this, and I... I, um, I want you to do it with me, okay? So let me say it to you first, and then I'm gonna ask you to repeat it with me, all right? I can either wake up in the morning, you can either wake up in the morning with the perspective of, I am blessed, or I am burdened, one or the other. It makes all the difference in your day. If you wake up in the morning, I am blessed, you are theocentric, God-centered, God-focused, and you're looking at what you do have, not what you don't have. If you wake up in the morning with, I am burdened, now all of a sudden you are bearing the things that you ought to be turning over to the Lord and you're looking at what you don't have. So I want you to say that with me, would you? Let's repeat after me. I can either wake up believing I am blessed or I am burdened. Now, with that in mind, we approach this series of mind works. How exactly is our mind working during all of this stuff? I I love the fact that our text today takes us to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was obviously very well educated. Among all the apostles, he was the most educated, sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was being trained to be a master teacher, master rabbi. God got a hold of his life. For three years, he spent time with the Lord in the desert of Arabia, and God began to enlighten him as to all of those things that he had learned, what the true understanding and meaning of it was. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, I'm going to simplify it as we uh, read it in a moment, but basically he says, the things that I would not, those are the things I do. And the things that I would do, those are the things I can't seem to do. You ever feel that way? The things I know I should do, I'm not doing the things I know I shouldn't do. Well, those are the things that I find myself doing. And so what do you do about that? Well, uh, let's go to the text. Romans chapter seven is where he says all of this. And so we're gonna look at a phrase in verse 23, Romans seven, verse 23. And the phrase has to do with the war that is going on. So if you're there, say, I'm there. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So earlier, he goes through all of this, uh, starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now the word carnal, uh, you could pick up on the term carnivorous, meaning uh, flesh eating. And the word carnal is fleshly. He said, the law is spiritual. That is what God has to say to me is is a spiritual, it it requires a spiritual mindedness to understand. But I, I'm still in the flesh, he said. As we approach this, let me just say to you, you had to deal with the flesh this morning, didn't you? You had to deal with it yesterday as you watched the Gators uh, uh, and Kentucky, but you had to deal with the flesh and, and you may not have wanted to come to church today. You, you may be fighting that. Maybe some of you who are even attending online, you didn't necessarily want to come on live stream and, and you fought through that. You fought through the fleshly side of things because we are in the flesh. And Paul is saying, because I'm in the flesh, but the things I want to do, the things that God would have me do, that's in the spirit. Then there's this war that goes on in my mind, warring against the law of my mind. 
So let's uh, read on verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So why, why can't we seem to do what we know we ought to do and not do what we know we shouldn't do? What, why is that? He explains it in the next verse, verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. You know, one of the benefits of coming to church, one of the benefits of being involved in a life group, one of the benefits of having a daily devotion in your personal life is that when you spend that time, you sort of refocus your mind and and you remember, you remember that living a God-centered life is difficult and we have to constantly be reminded because we are in the flesh and as a result of being in the flesh, we have the will to do what is right. I believe this. I believe all of us, and I'm not even gonna ask for a raise of hands. I believe all of us would say, you know what? I would really like to live a life that would be considered to love God with all my mind. I think all of us wanna do that. So why isn't it easily done then? Since all of us wanna do it, why can't we do it? Why, what's the struggle? Where's the war? And why is that the case? Well, uh, we, uh, I wanna be careful because when I start a series, I wanna give you like all eight lessons in the first sermon. And, and uh, I will tell you that these four thoughts I'm about to give you each of them could be a sermon unto itself. And so I'm gonna to try to be brief with them, but I'm gonna approach this from, uh, from this perspective with you, that as you set out to um, love God with all your mind, if that's your goal, and I hope it is, as you set out to do that, there are at least four allied forces that are gonna war against you. And if you recognize the enemy, my hope is, if you recognize the enemy, you can better defeat them on a daily basis. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about these allied forces. The first one, if you wanna go ahead and fill in the blanks in your study sheet, if you wanna write it down, is the appetite of self. The appetite of self. Most of you probably uh, knew that I would not get through the Mind Work series without quoting one of my favorite authors, uh, Christian motivational speaker Zig Ziglar. And uh, he has a quote that I just love. So I want you to listen to it and, and listen, I hope, in a way that it encourages your heart. He said, you are what you are and where you are because of what has gone into your mind. You can change what you are and where you are by changing what goes into your mind. So this is a very important series that we're in right now. You can literally allow the Holy Spirit to make huge, great changes in the way we live if we will allow him to do it. And a lot of it has to do with what we're shoving into our minds because what we shove in is exactly what we get out. And so I hope that uh, this will be a help to you. But the appetite of self, what, what do we mean by that? Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. The, the flesh has an appetite. And I'm not talking about just, uh, uh, you're gonna get hungry in a little bit. It, it's about that, I don't know whether you had a donut or a cup of coffee or whether you got a, uh, I know you didn't get a Chick-fil-A biscuit unless it was left over. It's a Sunday and they're not open, but... Um, uh, the, uh, the idea here is simply this. You're gonna get hungry. Why? It's part of nature. And Paul is saying, listen, I struggle because it's part of nature. I'm still in this body. I'm still in this flesh. One day, the rapture is gonna take place and we're gonna get a new body. One day, we're gonna leave this world and we're gonna have a new body and we will no longer have the flesh that competes against us. But right now, it is part of the allied force that works against us. It gets hungry. It desires certain things that we should not desire. 
And I'm not talking about just your, your physical diet. I'm not saying that you desire uh, danishes and you need to stay away from the sugar or uh, you have this uh, wonderful um, desire for a coconut cream pie, which I do right now for some reason. But uh, you, you, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the flesh desires certain things and if we're not careful, we will yield to those appetites and then we have problems that we deal with. For instance, uh, verse 19, uh, Paul said, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do that I practice. For if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Notice verse 21. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. You know, I really want to do what's right. That's, that's probably true of everybody in this building. You know, I really want to do what's right. I just can't seem to do it all the time. And I, I tend to fall back on this thing of the appetite of the flesh. In the late 1800s, a fairly famous chief of the Lakota Sioux Indians that you and I and those in history know as Sitting Bull made this statement. Inside of me, there are two dogs. One is mean and evil, and the other is good. And they fight each other all the time. When asked which one wins, I answer, the one I feed the most. So I want you to understand today that you have the spirit of Christ. If you've been born again, you have the spirit of Christ that lives in you, and then you have the flesh. And they war against each other. Now, which one are you going to feed? Because the one that you feed is going to get stronger than the one that you starve. Galatians chapter five and verse 16 reads this way. I say then, walk in the spirit and you will or shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. All right, so in, in essence, this is uh, what Paul is saying over in, to the church of Galatia. I think he's saying this, listen, you have the spirit and, and it is inside the flesh. They both have this, this desire and, and the spirit wants its way. The Holy Spirit wants you to yield to him. But the flesh has an appetite. Which of these are you going to feed? Are you going to do those things that feed the Spirit of God? And then Paul said, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In other words, get so busy doing what you know you ought to be doing that you really don't have time to do what you really don't want to do and what you know you shouldn't do. It's been said uh, many, many times over the years that idleness is the devil's workshop. What that translates to is that when you find yourself not doing what is right, you now have greater opportunity to do what is wrong. That's all it, <laughs> that's what it translates to. So get busy doing what is right. Find something that occupies your mind that's a positive thing in the, in the way of, of serving God. Uh, I'm gonna appeal to the older congregation for just a minute. And uh, can I get an amen? amen? 1972, whoo, that was way back. Ricky Nelson, don't amen that. Anyway, Ricky Nelson wrote a song called Garden Party that described a philosophy of life that was prevalent then and is still, believe it or not, prevalent today. And the chorus of that simply says, but it's all right now, I've learned my lesson well. You see, you can't please everyone so you what so you got to please yourself that was the philosophy and that is the philosophy that is out there today and it's one that's available it's not the best for you it's one that wars against pleasing God you see if we are born again and living in the spirit and being led by the spirit the last phrase of that ought to read not so we got to please ourselves but instead that we can't please everyone so let us try to please the savior let us live to please the lord not ourselves not ourselves but in reality um, the world uh, calls self what number one 
Well, when you got saved, that changed. You're not number one. You shouldn't be. God is number one. Can I get an amen? He's number one. So what happened? Somehow we, we usurped that. We took that away from God when we start allowing the flesh to have its way. Number two, write it down if you will, the second allied uh, enemy, the force, the allurement of sin. Now I'm gonna make a very obvious statement. You can roll your eyes up in your head uh, physically if you'd like, or you can do it uh, as some of us do um, just uh, internally uh, from time to time. But uh, sin is attractive. There you go, you roll your eyes up. Okay, we, tell me something I don't know. Because if, if sin was not attractive, if it didn't have an allurement, it wouldn't give us a problem. But the flesh works with the allurement of sin, the attractiveness of sin, even though it's extremely dangerous, it allures us. It brings us to it. And if we're not careful, we fall prey to it. Romans chapter seven, again, verse 20, reads this way. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Then I find a law that evil is present with me. We read this verse a little while ago. Evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I, I'm attracted to the wrong things. You say, well, if I wasn't attracted to the wrong things, then I wouldn't have some of the problems that I've got today. You're right, but sin has an allurement. I'm gonna read to you a passage of scripture that I have, um, I have come to truly appreciate over the years uh, as being a... Um, uh, it, it's a great verse, and, and it's controversial in the world that you and I live in. I'll show you why in, in just a second, but it's in Proverbs. You've probably read it a million times, and I don't know if, if you have applied it to your life or not, but let me show it to you because I think it talks about the allurement of sin and how that it is attractive and it leaves us in a horrible state. Proverbs 23, beginning in verse 29 who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup when it swirls around smoothly. Are you listening to what I'm reading to you? Here, here's what the word of God is telling us. The wisdom of Proverbs has said, and I've not finished my text yet. The wisdom of Proverbs has said that do not, the counsel is, do not look on the wine as it swirls around, as it allures you. Do not let it, convince you that this is the thing you ought to take, that this is the thing you ought to do. Don't do that. And, and there's an allurement. That's what I want to get across to you. Now look at verse 32. At last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? When you read this text, here's what you find. The Bible's saying, listen, don't look on the wine and, and, and be taken by it. It, it has some extremely poor effects on your life. It can result in, in horrible tragedies. And it describes a man who is drunken, who is beaten and does not feel it, who wakes the next morning wondering what in the world has gone on. And then he says, I'll seek it yet again. It's an addiction that is developed. 
I don't know where you are in this. I know that there are a lot of Christians today who uh, see nothing wrong with wine. Personally, I do not drink because I deal with families who do. And uh, I see the adverse effect. Um, If you've ever had an alcoholic in your family, uh, you might stop and take note of your own personal testimony. I know this is an individual journey. And as we deal with the flesh and as we deal with the allurement of sin, I use this uh, really not to pick on anyone, but simply to say that the Proverbs speak of it. I've walked into restaurants, by the way, I enjoy a really good steak. I really do. Can I get an amen? Amen. And you can barely walk into a steak restaurant and not find this huge wall of alcohol with these beautiful bottles and colors and well lit. And I mean, it is alluring and it is attractive and you don't see that with anything else. You don't walk into a store and they have the onion rings displayed uh, (laughs) with these wonderful lights and glistening colors and Uh, you're not going to find that. So you say, what are you getting at? I'm saying to you that we need to be careful of our testimony and be aware. And I, I, I'm not trying to pick on just that subject. It can apply to so many other things in our life. The point is this, that a lot of stuff that can harm us and a lot of stuff that can hurt our testimony and a lot of stuff that takes us out of the frame of mind that could be considered to be a mind that loves God. Can you love God and be in a drunken stupor? Can you love God and be out of your mind? Can you, can you love God with all your mind and not have your senses about you? If you can, I hope that you'll stop me after the service and tell me how, because I don't understand that. I, I do not understand that. And I'm telling you that it's known as a dependency because it is one and that God would have us depend on him. And I would encourage you to stop and realize what the scriptures are teaching. All right, so let me move on. And for that, God's people said, amen. And uh, 1 John chapter 2, I've not gotten to the third point yet with you, but 1 John chapter 2 describes to us more of this thinking about uh, the allurement of sin, how sin reaches out to us, and sin begs us to take of it, uh, regardless of whatever that might be. 1 John 2 and verse 15 reads this way, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, now listen to this list. This encompasses all that is in the world. Now I'm, I'm amazed by that. I, I think it's very interesting that you're going to describe all that is in the world with three short phrases, but that's exactly what the text does. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does does the will of God abides forever. So let me talk about this for a minute. Because the allurement of sin, whatever that allurement is, is going to come to us through one of those three doors. Now, if you've sat under my ministry any length of time, you know I've talked about this before. This is not the first time, but I want to give this to you because if you can recognize which door it is being knocked on, you have the choice not to answer it. And in some cases, you can even avoid that particular allurement. So let's break these down. We have the lust of the flesh. We're, we talked about that in our first point. The flesh has an appetite. We have the lust of the eyes. Now let's talk about that for just a moment. Many times what we see, the scriptures even say, my eye affects my heart. So what we see affects the way we feel. So what you put before your eyes has a lot to do with whether or not you end up doing something you know you shouldn't do. Can I get an uh uh-huh or an amen? That's pretty quiet. Um, People, they're amen a minute at home now. <laughs> they are. But um, some of you are mad at me about that last point, aren't you? I'm sorry, but it is what it is. And I'm going to give you the word of God, whether you take it or not. I hope you take it and um, don't throw it back at me, but just know. All right. So, so we got the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. Uh, the psalmist said this in Psalm 101 verse 3 at the beginning. He said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. 
You know, the truth is, you cannot control everything that passes before you, but you can control some of it. Amen? You can control some of it. So if we are allured by sin, by what comes before our eyes, the question is this. Are we trying to avoid any of it? Or are we actually enhancing those things going before us? There might be some things that we can do that would change that. And then there's the pride of life. The pride of life, I think, in, in all honesty, I think the lust of the flesh, pretty easy to acknowledge and identify. The lust of the eyes, most of us can agree. I think that's pretty easy to explain. Pride of life is a different story. Pride of life is, um, I think this one is the door that uh, the devil knocks on bringing temptation more than any other door when it comes to Christians. I believe this. Because the pride of life, you can be, you can be pharisaical and self-righteous and do none of those other things and yet have to deal with the pride of life. When we talk about this, I, I'm reminded in Romans chapter 12, verse three, it reads this way. For I say that through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Okay, so on one side, we have uh, the word of God saying, don't think too high of yourself. But then there's the other issue. Some people aren't thinking too highly of themselves, they're thinking too lowly of themselves. And a low self-esteem is just as bad as a inflated self-esteem. And so the Bible reminds us in Luke chapter 12, for instance, uh, verse six, are not five sparrows sold for two copper cones, uh, co uh, coins, excuse me, and not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. A healthy self-esteem is what we ought to be after. Not an inflated one and not one that is so low we fail to understand God's love for us. A healthy self-esteem. And I believe it comes, listen, through a sound mind, through a mind that seeks to love God and a mind that tells us and is aware of the fact Nobody knows you like Jesus, and nobody loves you like Jesus. The third in the allied forces, and finally it's going to come now, the one that we always blame, uh, that is the attack of Satan, if you want to write it down. The attack of Satan is the third of the allied forces. Now, we usually blame Satan for all of the above. We, uh, we don't think about the self having an appetite. We just say, oh, as a devil. The devil made me do it. Amen? No, the devil didn't make you do it. Uh, sometimes it's just the flesh and you wanted it and you wanted to do it. And it had nothing to do uh, necessarily with, with him. And, and then there's just the allurement of sin. Sin itself is attractive. And for some, just the, um, just the fact that you were told you can't do it made you want to do it. Amen? You, you, some of you are looking at other people now, and you ought to be amening that instead of just looking at them. But, but it's true. And, and there's something in the heart of man that that happens. But then the Bible calls Satan the tempter. So he uses these other things. Uh, you're familiar with it. Um, First uh, Peter chapter five, verse eight and nine, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Can I, can I share this with you? If you are a married couple sitting here today and listening to this, the devil would truly look and is looking for every opportunity to destroy your marriage. That's all he, he wants to devour. He doesn't want to help you. He doesn't want to nurse you along. He doesn't want to assist you so that you grow in your relationship with each other and your relationship with God. He's going to work against that and you have to be aware that every single day you are facing that adversary. Be aware of that. 
If you're a young person today, I want you to know he, he's out to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your life. The uh, chairman of our elders, Brother Mark Peck, was in my office with me this morning praying with me before the service began and we were talking about how unique it seems to be right now that you're seeing a lot of commercials that deal with uh, hopelessness and anxiety and uh, uh, just living a life of depression and how to come out of that and, and mental illness, uh, they're calling it. And, and there's a lot of... Um, there's just a lot of, of, of information right now that is out there. And, and he mentioned this to me, and I thought it was a great point. He, he, he said, you know, really what it seems to amount to is people are dealing with problems and they have no coping mechanism. And then he used this phrase, no hoping mechanism. Is it not true that, that the world is trying to give answers to problems that Jesus is really the answer to, but they don't know Jesus, so they don't offer him as a solution. They want to come up with something else that you and I have the answer. He ought to be our coping mechanism. He ought to be our hoping mechanism. But Satan will try to convince you you don't have one. He'll try to destroy your worth and he'll tell you all sorts of stuff. He's a liar and the father of all lies. And if you're not careful, you'll buy into those lies. He's called the tempter in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 5. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Every single day you're under attack. You didn't have to do anything for it. You wake up in the morning, you open your eyes and the devil is ready and his demons are ready and they want to war against you today. You've already done some battles before you ever got to this point because he didn't want you to hear this. There are people right now watching this, maybe even a delayed broadcast. He worked hard to keep them from ever hearing that their hope can be in Christ. He doesn't want people to know that. He wants to destroy your relationship with each other. You're, he wants to take your life if he can get it. Don't let him. Give it to Christ. Love God with all your mind. With all your mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God, who is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. All right, so let's face a few facts. First of all, your temptations and what you are facing, you are not unique in. The Bible says they're common among men. A lot of other people have had exactly the same temptations you have. Many of them have learned to deal with them. Many of them have learned to trust God and overcome them. Some have not. The Bible says there will always be a way of escape. If you belong to the Lord and you are facing a temptation, it's because God thought you were able to handle it. And then he'll also supply a way of escape. So I want to encourage you, when you find yourself in those circumstances, say a little prayer. And the little prayer might sound like this. Lord, show me the way of escape. Help me to get out of this thing before I ever get into this thing. And he will. I believe he will. And then last of all, let me deal with this subject with you. And I think this is an important one. So don't, don't bail out on me yet. Uh, there's one more point, one more allied force. And this is very powerful. We're going to call it the argument of society. The argument of society. I do believe that this is one of the reasons why and I want to speak to our young people that are here today. Earlier, I made a 1972 reference for all of our old people. And now I want to speak to our young people for a moment because many of them are dealing with this on a regular basis. If you're in college, you may be dealing with this thing of higher education, not acknowledging your faith, differing with you as to your beliefs, your doctrine, your understanding and so I want to share some things with you that may help you in this. There's a desire within every person to fit in. It has always been that way. 
when you were little, when you were younger, uh, and you started uh, uh, able, you were able to understand what other people had, you felt like you had to have it. You didn't even know why you had to have it, but if you didn't have it, then you didn't fit in. It might have been a certain tennis shoe or a pair of jeans or uh, something else, I don't know, maybe a, a record or a CD or a whatever, a, a game. But you didn't have it and you didn't fit in until you got it. Now, the peer pressure, by the way, continues throughout your life. It's not, it's not just for young people. Uh, it might turn into something else, but you see it all the time on social media. You, you have people who only show certain pictures. The, you only see the good, by the way. Life, boy, if life could ever be just as good as we portray it. Can I get an amen? And, uh, but it's not that way, is it? We don't, we don't show the bad pictures. We only show the good ones. We don't show the bad times. We only show the good times. And we go months sometimes, weeks sometimes, days sometimes without posting anything. And so my point is this simply with you. Be careful because society works against who you are. You may not know this, but as a child of God, you are part of a counterculture. A counterculture. And every day you meet the culture. It's no wonder you don't feel like you fit in. I hope you don't feel like you fit in. I hope that when you're among the people of God, you feel like you fit in. Because this is where you fit in. You're a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ and he didn't fit in. So when you get out into the world, understand what the scripture says about you, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners... And pilgrims abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your own good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know what the short version of that? Um, live with a mind that loves God and others will see it. And give glory to God. It's hard. I know it's hard. Galatians 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So who are you after pleasing? Who do you want to please? You want to please those peers? You want to please those professors? You want to please those neighbors? Who is it? that you are after impressing. Identify it. Should it not be to please God? Are you not a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? A bond servant is one who has received their freedom and stays and serves the master because they love the master. We serve Christ in freedom. It's not that we have to. He gave us eternal life. We're not trying to earn it. That would cease to be grace. But we serve him because we love him. And we represent him in a dark and dying world. And so I say to you that are young and you're dealing with a culture that wants to say that you don't know what you're talking about. Let me stop for a moment and tell you, you have answers to questions they cannot resolve. You have answers to questions they continue to have. You can take them in their views of evolution and take them all the way back to that speck of dust. They cannot tell you where the dust came from. Take them all the way back. You tell them about your God who has always been and spoke the world into being. Ask them this question. I beg of you, ask them this question. Give me, please, can you give me one example of anything with order that came from chaos on its own. Give me one example, just one. Take the textbook that is in your class and tell the teacher that you have a hypothesis you would like to share and ask opinion on. Tell them that you believe that this textbook 
came from an explosion at a print shop and that all the numbers and letters and pages and paragraphs and and all of them just ended up in there in order and made sense and sentences and you could thumb through the pages orderly and it has a printed cover and it is all bound. Tell them that you believe it just exploded into being and they will laugh you to scorn but let them tell you that's how you came about. And I suggest you laugh them to scorn. It's preposterous. The culture is a bully. And bullies intimidate when they don't have the answers. You have the answers. So stand for God in a world that doesn't. I give you in closing the story of Daniel. Who loved God with all his mind. In the sixth chapter, Daniel had been elevated in a position in Babylon, by the way, a heathen nation, a nation that did not know the God of Daniel. Some of the people got together and they said, we're going to make a law against this Daniel and we're going to trick him. We're going to cause him to fall. So they went to the king and they made a decree. And in the law of the Persians and Medes, when a decree was made by the king, it could not be overturned. And the decree was simple. O king, for the next 30 days, do not let anyone in the kingdom make petition of any god or any man except of thee, just of you. Well, the king liked it. He said, let's sign it and do it. The Bible tells us that Daniel, knowing that the decree was signed, went into his house with windows open and he prayed to God three times as was his custom from early days. I love that. So they saw him, imagine that. Was he trying to impress them? Not at all. He was seeking to please God because he loved God with all his mind. So what happens? You know the story. Most of you do. If you don't, it's a great story to read. So the king gets word. Daniel has disobeyed the law. He is to be brought and thrown into the den of lions. The king was sad because the king loved Daniel. But the law had to be obeyed. So they took Daniel and they threw him in the den of lions. And God caused lockjaw with those old lions. Can you imagine what went on there? I could could talk about the story of Daniel in the lion's den for a long, long time and I'll try not to. But what a great story. So the king could not sleep that night. He was so troubled. And so early in the morning, he comes to the edge the edge of the den and he calls out and Daniel answers. He answers. Was your God able to spare you? Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, King. I I have no harm. And the king sends out another decree. Take all those guys over there that made me write that thing before and throw them in there. And and, and the the Bible tells us that before they ever hit the ground, you read it, you see it. They broke their bones and devoured them. The lions did. The king sent out another decree. Let everybody know that the God of Daniel, he is God. He is God. I'm asking you to be a Daniel in a Babylonian world. I'm asking you to love God with all your mind when there are many competing forces for your thoughts. I want to conclude by simply asking you to set a diet spiritually when the appetite of the flesh arises. Discipline yourself and avoid as much as possible from the allurement of sin. Recognize the attack of Satan. Be vigilant. Resist. And stand, the Bible says. And when it comes to society, understand God can deliver you. 
Paul said at the end of Romans chapter seven, beginning in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I'm gonna close with giving you just two things to practice. Thanksgiving and service. Paul said, I thank God and I serve him, the law of my mind. I serve him. He doesn't speak in past tense. I served, no, 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 he serves. While the battle rages, seek to thank him and to serve him. And you'll find it's a little easier to love him with all your mind. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today and we ask you to bless this time. Lord, we call this a response time because we're asking people to think about and to respond as the Holy Spirit may lead them. Today, Lord, there may be many, many different things going on in our minds. So I pray that you'll help us, that you'll guide us, that we will follow you as you lead some may need to come to the altar because you lead them to do so. And maybe they need to come and pray for a family member, a friend, or maybe for ourselves. We need to come and we need to acknowledge some things that have been competing for you in our minds. Some of us may just need to come and say, God, I need your help. Here I am. I need you to help me with the way I think. Give me victory. Help me to say every day, I am blessed instead of I am burdened. Father, I pray that you will bless this time we spend together. And if there's one here that does not know you, Lord, I pray, call them unto salvation. Help them to realize that all of this begins by entering a relationship with you. And that is only done through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to accept what you did, Lord Jesus, on the cross of Calvary for us. May you bless in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? As the Lord leads, you come, you pray. If you'd like to know more about how to enter that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we have some people that are serving as counselors to your left and to your right at the doorways. They'd love to take the word of God and show you how you could be saved. Those who are here for baptism, would you please go ahead and get ready? as we will be baptizing in a moment. While Brother Sean leads us in a song, you pray, you come if you will, as God leads. In the crushing, in the pressing, Thank you.
Thank you, Pastor. What an awesome day in the Lord. Amen. Amen. We have three being baptized today. It's awesome to see a young person, to see a couple of adults, and even someone a little later in their lives, one of our pastor's fathers being baptized today. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. I would like to announce that we have a table set up right outside for our Directions Discipleship discipleship Ministry. And if you want more information about that, you can sign up. We'll get information to you. Pastor Robbie, Brother Keith, and uh, Sister Judy is out there. People who are going through or have gone through it. You know, discipleship is not a program. It's a lifestyle. As a child of God, we're called to be discipled. And then eventually to be a discipler. And so if you desire to be discipled, maybe you've been in the Lord for a long time or you're young in the Lord, but you've never had a one-on-one experience with someone to go through methodically the word of God. And we have it set up in 18 different lessons to where you're not going through practical just teaching. It is really edification through the word of God. It's taking the scripture Walking through from God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What is truth from the Word of God? How do we use prayer? Literally all the way to the point where we, as a a person who's accepted Jesus Christ, understands how we live to be like Christ. And what a beautiful day to highlight this then, our first week in our topic of mind works. Because Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so if you're interested in that, you stop, see one of those at the table just outside these first doors. They would love to be able to sign you up, maybe answer some of your questions. And uh, hopefully you'll be interested and we get our people involved in discipleship here. Now for some, some more details about our ladies event, please welcome Miss Lady Gail. Okay, all ladies and teen girls, this Saturday we're going to Savannah. Uh, to do a trolley tour, ride the little tour, and then we're going to shop, obviously, and we're going to eat lunch. So um, you can register online. So what you need to do is um, scan the QR code in the bulletin or go to epcjacks.com, register to go. So what we will do is meet at the church right out here uh, in front of this building at 8 o'clock, and when you register online, you can pick whether you want to drive your vehicle or you want to carpool with someone so that we can match up who wants to drive and who wants to ride. The cost is $40, and we're going to have a lot of fun. So don't forget to do that. If you could let us know by Wednesday, please try to register by Wednesday. That would be great. Thank you. All right. This is Sarah Newsom. Uh, She accepted Christ as her savior at Vacation Bible School this year. Sarah, if you were to die today, where would you go? I would go probably to heaven. To heaven, okay. Sarah, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen, amen. This is Mitchell Karasek, and we're excited about this. A couple weeks ago, uh, he contacted me. He said, Pastor, he said, man, I I got saved, you know, several years ago. He said, I've never followed the Lord in baptism. He said, I need to do that. And I was just thrilled when he said that, and you... you, uh, Some of you do not know that Mitchell works in the tech booth back there in the back for us. He handles a number of things, including the lighting for us. And he's just got such a servant's heart. He also takes care of all of our grounds for us, which always look nice. Uh, Disney has nothing on us, man. We look great. And uh, Mitchell, uh, he trusted Christ 2010, I believe it was, right? And uh, Bruce Collier, I think, led you to the Lord. Some of you remember Bruce? Amen. Yeah. Amen. So if you were to die today, where would you go, brother? Heaven. Heaven. Amen. Well, Mitchell, upon your profession of faith, in obedience to our Lord's command, I do now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in the newness of life.
What's up, church family? How's it going? So, if I start crying today, it's just because my wildcats won. Amen? God bless. All right, so this, if you haven't known him or met him yet, this is my dad. Yeah, so. Now, it's no secret that because of my background, I kind of let the devil into our family. But having a earthly dad like I've had, he never gave up on me, which was my first image of what God the Father was. So being able to do this as his son, for any of you that may have wayward sons or daughters, I want you to witness what's going to happen because God can do anything. Amen. Amen. Stephen, that's his name, by the way. I should have said that. Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Amen. Amen. By your profession of faith, Stephen, once the father of my flesh, now my brother in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank you so much for joining us for our worship service here at East Point. We are currently in our response time. And maybe you have a question, a comment, or even a prayer request that you'd like to share with us. You can send an email to office support at epcjacks.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Or maybe you'd like to support East Point. You can give in several ways. One way is on site to give in our offering buckets located in the sanctuary. Or you can go to epcjacks.com to give online. A third way is to text the word give to 904-204-0630. Thank you so much for your support. We understand that during this season of time, our online worship experience is the best option for you and your family. And we do appreciate your regular attendance with us. We look forward to the day that you can join us in person again. Or maybe you're tuning in with us for the first time. We're glad that you've joined us today. And maybe one day you can join us on site. We're located at 270 North Kernan Boulevard, Jacksonville, Florida, 32225. Come on in, join us for one of our worship services and enjoy one of our free cups of coffee. Thank you so much again. God bless you and have a wonderful day.